Not long ago, in a land far away, there was a group of elite female warriors known for their prowess in battle. They had a reputation for charging into overwhelming odds and never backing down. Observers reported that they were far more effective fighters than the men in their tribe. They were the Black Amazons of Benin. And this is their story. You're listening to Villains and Virgins podcast, and this is the fourth and final episode in a mini-series on the Amazons. Now, in episode one, we looked at the Greek legends of Amazons, or female fighters. And in episode two, we looked at the lives of the actual nomadic horse tribes and the women who lived among them and fought alongside their men. We also had a fascinating look at why archaeologists often assumed that the skeletons and the remains they found of these tribes were men, even though in many cases, later evidence has proven that they were female. And then there was episode three, where we discovered that women who rode horseback and used bow bows and arrows, and fought, persisted long after the time of the ancient Greeks, despite modern assumptions about gender roles to the contrary. In this fourth and final episode, we're going to look at a group of Amazons, or female fighters, whose story is very little known. I only discovered it during my research on the other episodes in this series, when I read a book by John Mann called The Amazons, and he devotes a chapter in it to the Black Amazons of Benin, and it's an amazing story. The Black Amazons got their name from European travelers, who were familiar with the Greek myths about female fighters that we've already covered. And so when they encountered these women, they assigned them the name Amazons, because it was the only term that they could think of that would describe what these women were and what they did. For those of you who watch Marvel movies, you may have been fascinated by the black female commando units, the Dora Malaji, in the kingdom of Wakanda. They were very much based on the women I'm going to tell you about in this episode. Our story begins in West Africa, in a country now known as Benin. But in the 1700s, it was called the Kingdom of Dahomey, and it was ruled by a tribe called the Fawn. The Dahomey Kingdom was founded in the 1600s and persisted until the end of the 1800s. The kingdom acquired much of its considerable wealth through the slave trade, which was at its peak during this period. The slaves that they sold came from other tribes that they had taken prisoners from, or captives that they had secured on raids. And they would then sell these unfortunate people to European slave traders who were flooding in to the ports on the coast of Benin in, in increasing numbers. And the slave trade became incredibly lucrative. The kingdom of Dahomey thrived as a result of this of this wealth that was being generated every time they could bring captives and sell them to the slavers. It's sometimes referred to as Black Sparta, this kingdom of Dahomey, because it was incredibly militaristic. While the selling of human captives into slavery is incredibly repugnant, it's important to remember that many of the other kingdoms and civilizations that we remember, such as the Greeks and the Romans, had a heavy reliance on slaves for their wealth as well. So in this sense, the kingdom of Dahomey was similar to the Greek city-states in a number of ways, and the slave trade was only one of them. There are reports that the Kingdom of Dahomey began having an annual celebration at some time in the 1730s. And the purpose of the celebration was to celebrate the king and the strength of the kingdom. And there were many events that would typically occur. There would be parades, there would be redistribution of wealth, there would be debates on public policy, there were military demonstrations, and there were ritual executions. This was part of a human sacrifice ceremony uh, that was done to propitiate the gods or the ancestors. And in many reports, there would be at least 500 captives who would be executed on this day. But in some cases, the numbers were far, far higher. The typical method that was used was beheading. The kings of Dahomey were absolute monarchs. They were held in great awe by their people. There are accounts from European travelers who witnessed uh, episodes of the king of Dahomey holding court, of people prostrating themselves, laying out uh, mats for the king to walk on, uh, and, and, and just this incredibly ritualized series of actions to demonstrate reverence toward the king. 
One fascinating feature of the kingdom is that a bureaucracy of common people held the major administrative posts in the kingdom. So they would be overseeing things like the law and the collection of taxes and so on. But the king would appoint commoners to these positions. Members of his family were not permitted to hold these offices. And the reasoning was that the king believed common people would be more loyal to him because they owed him everything for putting them in these positions, whereas members of his own family or the upper classes might attempt to use these positions to increase their own power, potentially in treacherous ways. But another fascinating feature is that every male administrator had a female counterpart, a female overseer, who was sort of the shadow partner of that administrative position and would report to the king on how this was being carried out. Who were these women and why were they in such important positions? Well, that's very much part of the story that we're about to unfold. The story of the women of the Kingdom of Dahomey, the ones who become this elite unit, begins in the 1700s. And they begin as palace guards, because in the 1700s, the king of Dahomey makes a decision that no men will be permitted to sleep within the palace walls at night. So only women and eunuchs. So who is going to provide the security? There are going to have to be women who fill those positions, and that is exactly what happens. It's not clear to me why the king made the decision that no men were going to be permitted in the palace walls after dark. Presumably there'd been some episodes, either of men behaving inappropriately towards the women behind the palace enclosure, or possibly of men presenting a threat to the king or the royal family. I haven't come across the exact details, so these are speculations on my part, but this was a radical measure that the king was taking to ensure his own security. By the end of that century, by the end of the 1700s, there were several hundred female guards who were in charge of the palace security. And locals called them the king's wives, or sometimes our mothers. But these are terms that require some explanation. The women guards may initially have been chosen from amongst the king's wives, perhaps the, the ones that he wasn't interested in having children with. A king in this position would have been presented with many women, many offers of marriage, to cement ties. And so the number of women that would be living in a palace compound would be very large. And the king wasn't necessarily interested in having children with all of the women who might be presented to him as wives. So it may be that the initial palace security was taken from some of these women who were living in the palace compound, but weren't really regular visitors to the king's bedroom. Another possibility is that this was just a title that was given to them to signify a bond of personal loyalty, that it wasn't really an indication of any uh, formal sexual or marital legal relationship. It was more to do with designating these women as personally bonded to the king in the way that wives might be, although their duties were significantly different. What does seem clear is that the women who were bodyguards or the palace security detail were quite different from the women the king was sleeping with. This doesn't seem to have been a flexible category whereby the, the king was picking off some of his security guards to sleep with or sending some of the women that he was sleeping with to do security detail. It doesn't seem to have been at all uh, a mutable distinction. There were king's wives who lived in his bedroom and he had children with, and then there were king's wives, quote unquote, who were actually palace bodyguards. And you were one or the other, as far as we can tell. But the female guards were expected to remain celibate. They had to take this oath when they became part of that unit, and they were not allowed to marry during the term of their service. So essentially, their only function was security. They weren't having families. They didn't have any other personal bonds of loyalty to a husband or children that might interfere with the performance of their duties. It was in fact forbidden for other men in Benin to have relationships with these women. That was a taboo and it was a punishable offense. We're going to get to the training and the abilities that these women developed 
in a little bit. But first, I'd just like to point out that this was not the first or the last time that a king would have an all-female bodyguard. The King of Siam, which is a country that is now known as Thailand, had, from the 17th century, an all-female bodyguard unit called the Chrome Clone. They were trained in the use of muskets and pistols, they maintained security in the palace compound, and they also functioned as a sort of police as well, in terms of keeping law and order in the immediate vicinity. Some reports indicate that they were even occasionally required to assist the army, the, the army of Siam, or later Thailand, if there were uh, periods of unrest or civil difficulty that the army was having a hard time dealing with. This unit of female bodyguards in Thailand still exists. In 2019, the new king of Thailand married a woman who was from his bodyguard unit. She already had the rank of general and she became his wife. He also had another woman drawn from the same unit who was a concubine of his and was notorious, generated a lot of gossip for going in and out of his good graces. But these women who are highly competent, who have military ranks, and whose job it is to defend the personal security of the king in Thailand are still functional to this day. Of course, Muammar Gaddafi of Libya was also notorious for having a core of female bodyguards. The numbers in his case were far, far smaller though. In many cases, that unit would comprise about 30 women. We weren't talking about women in the hundreds or thousands as we are in the kingdom of Dahomey in Benin. But Gaddafi made lots of headlines for running around with his all-female bodyguards. However, these women seemed to be mainly for show, although there were one or two incidents where a female member of that unit put herself between a bullet and Gaddafi. Since the fall of Gaddafi, there have been a number of reports from women who formerly served as part of that unit, which detail horrific levels of sexual abuse from Gaddafi himself and his sons and other male members of the establishment. So while they were sort of a shocking and tabloid attracting phenomenon in Libya, they weren't a functional military unit in the same way that uh, they will be in Benin. The palace guard in Benin, in the kingdom of Dahomey, were the real deal. They put their bodies on the line whenever there was a succession dispute or any other problem that involved the king. And there were English traders that had dealings with the kingdom that report that in 1774, 285 of these women died in an internal succession conflict for who was going to be the next king. 15 years later, when there was another succession controversy, 600 hundred of these women lost their lives. Now, whether these bodyguards died because they were, they were fighting each other during these conflicts, or whether some of the deaths were caused by the king who won, deciding that he wasn't safe until he eliminated the guards that had served the previous king, the number of women who died shows that they were taken seriously, and they were real players in terms of the shift of power inside the kingdom. By the 1800s, King Gezo of Dahomey decided to expand their numbers. Instead of just being palace guards, these women were going to be expanded to become part of the regular army. Some historians suggest that the kingdom at this time was dealing with an outsized male to female population. In other words, there were far more women around than men. And in many cases, this was because large numbers of men were missing. They were missing due to ongoing violence between the tribes and also due to the slave trade, because it wasn't just the kingdom of Dahomey that was raiding other tribes and stealing people that they could sell. Other tribes were raiding them and stealing their men as well. You have to remember that the slave trade at this time in the 1800s was massive. And by many estimates, up to 20% of the population of Benin, Nigeria, and Togo was lost to that trade. So if one in every five men are gone, that's gonna create some serious problems for your military. Large numbers of the slaves who ended up working in the brutal sugar plantations of Haiti and Trinidad came from this section of the Benin coast, which was controlled by the Fon and one or two other tribes. So many of them came from the kingdom of Dahomey itself. 
The coast of Benin and western Nigeria was referred to by European traders as the Slave Coast because it was one of the primary areas that they came to with their ships to purchase the lucrative human cargo. Estimates of the number of people lost from this region alone are in the vicinity of two to three million. And when scholars try to evaluate the number of total people lost to the slave trade, the numbers that keep coming up are close to 12 million. While there's not enormous certainty with these numbers, they are rough estimates at best, what you can be sure of is that we're talking about very large numbers of missing people, and that was going to have an effect on the people and communities left behind. So in 1844, the king of Dahomey suffers an attack by a neighboring tribe, the Yoruba, which came very close to threatening his personal safety. And it may have been at this moment that he decided he needed to beef up his military and add more women. Girls could be enlisted in the new all-female battalions in a number of ways. If they'd committed a crime, then they could be forced in as part of their punishment. Some were conscripted. Others volunteered. Some of the girls were captured on raids on other tribes. So they were captives that, instead of being sold into slavery, were kept in the kingdom and required to serve in these military units. But the most consistent source of enlistments were the campaigns that the king himself ran every three years. Apparently, he would send some of his representatives into all the villages of the kingdom, and they would assess young girls between the ages of 12 and 15. They would select the tallest, strongest, and most agile girls. And these girls, once selected, would then be transported out of their villages and into a life that many of them could never have imagined. They were leaving behind what they had expected their lives would look like. So all the ties to their village, to their kin, the expectation of marrying into that village and maintaining a network of connections, all of that would be left behind them forever. And they would become members of these new units with an entirely different life from anything that was on offer to other women in the kingdom. But parents weren't always thrilled about this. Having your daughter selected in many ways meant losing her in a way that was far more significant than marriage. Marriage in traditional societies has often been regarded as the loss of a daughter because she goes into someone else's family and household. But if that household was part of the same village, then you could expect that at least you would see your daughter and possibly your grandchildren. But if your teenage daughter, age 13 or 14, in Benin, was selected by the king's advisors, in all likelihood, she would never be seen again by her family. And so there were some families that hid their daughters when the king's representatives came into town, hoping to keep them close by. In 1845, only one year after King Gezo suffers the Yoruba attack, which probably kicks the enlistment of women into high gear, there's a Scottish explorer named John Duncan who visits the kingdom of Benin and he's got a chance to view these new female units. He estimates their number at between six and 8,000 women. So that's a very significant expansion of the number of women who are now serving in the military. According to Naval Officer Arthur Wilmot, quote, he's referring to the women, they are far superior to the men in everything, in appearance, in dress, in figure, in activity, and in their performance as soldiers and in bravery. So by 1845, not only are there a large number of these women, but they're conspicuous for their effectiveness, at least in the eyes of external observers who wrote down for us what they saw. At this same time, in the mid-1840s, the Kingdom of Dahomey is experiencing a large number of other changes, primarily economic. You see, Britain banned the slave trade in 1807, and it was shortly followed by several other European countries. So the market for slaves was beginning to shrink because many of the best customers, Britain included, were no longer showing up in slave boats to buy. So an enormous source of revenue for the kingdom was dwindling dramatically. Instead, they had to shift to cultivating palm oil in the kingdom, which they did. And while they kept slaves, they were no longer in such large numbers. Slaves were still captured from other tribes and kept in Dahomey, but primarily now for cultivating palm oil, which was going to be the primary source of revenue. But for all that, 
Palm oil could not replace the wealth that had been possible under the slave trade. It was a dramatic reduction in the amount of money coming in. Richard Burton, not the one who married Elizabeth Taylor, but a much earlier and more notorious Richard Burton, uh, visited the Kingdom of Dahomey on a diplomatic mission for the British government in 1860. At the time of his visit, the Kingdom of Dahomey's economy has been shrinking, but the number of women in the army has been growing. Burton left a detailed written record of his observations in the kingdom, and he devotes a large number of words to the women that he observes functioning as palace guards and as soldiers. According to Burton, every young woman in the kingdom actually had to be brought before the king and be inspected before she was permitted to marry. And the king could choose, upon reviewing any particular young woman, to enlist her in the units known as the king's wives, which, remember, isn't entry into his harem, but it's entry into these female battalions. So in order to maintain their numbers, there was a very active conscription process going on. Burton reports that the women had specialized units. Some of them were called blunderbuss women. So they would wield rifles, which were not as sophisticated as the latest and greatest rifle technology in Europe at the time, but they did have firearms that had been sold and purchased in the kingdom, and they were in use in the army at the time. So some units were devoted just to the blunderbuss. Other women were called reaper women, and they would wield a three-foot blade. This was a weapon that was specially designed in Benin by some accounts, and they claimed that they could cut a man in half with it because it was a three foot long razor sharp blade. So some women were just part of that unit. Others still were scouts. They were involved in reconnaissance missions, and there were many other units as well. Many of the women's units were infantry, but some of the bravest and most elite were elephant hunting units in Burton's reports. When we talk about elephant hunting units, we don't mean women riding on elephants to fight. We mean some of these female units would be in charge of hunting down and killing elephants, particularly problem elephants that might be causing difficulty in some of the uh, communities in the kingdom. This would be a very dangerous job, and only the bravest and most competent would be put in charge of it. Burton repeats the report that females in the army were required to be celibate, and that anyone having any kind of relationship with them was subject to punishment. And punishments could range from imprisonment to death. However, Burton also reports that during his time in Dahomey, he witnessed the punishment of 150 of these women for having relationships with men only eight of them were executed. So this tells us that while there was an oath of celibacy, uh, in practice, it wasn't strictly observed. And while the men in Dahomey weren't supposed to be consorting with female soldiers, it was going on. There were punishments, but they weren't always as extreme as what the books dictated they could be. Burton also noted, and I quote, such was the size of the female skeleton and the muscular development of the frame that in many cases, femininity could only be detected by the bosom. He's talking about their breasts, in case you're not familiar with Victorian English. But remember, Burton is contrasting these women with Victorian images of femininity at the time. And if you remember what women in England were wearing in the 1860s, you have to have an image of a tightly corseted figure uh, with stays that were so tight that women could barely breathe, let alone bend over properly. And once they were imprisoned in a corset, a woman also had a wire frame that would be attached at her waist and would bulge out in various ways to give the appearance of a large and full hip and buttock area and voluminous heavy skirts. So Victorian women were prisoners of their garments. It wasn't really... Uh, a way of dressing that allowed anything more than a gentle walk, and reports of women being, you know, short of breath and feeling faint are very many. So it's no wonder that if that, a very pale, very weak example of femininity was what Burton had in his mind, that he would be shocked by these extremely physical, very athletic, bare-skinned women of Benin, and that he would associate their vigorous physicality with being male. 
The women of Benin themselves saw themselves as part of an elite class raised above the common people by the king's favor. And there's lots of evidence that they were very proud of it. There's a song that is reported to have been sung, which is a little bit gory, but tells you a lot about their attitude. Again, this is from Richard Burton that we get this source, but he says they were singing, quote, let the men remain at home growing corn and palms. We, the women, we're going to bring back entrails with our hoes and our machetes. So basically, let the men do the farming, we're gonna go and kill things. This, this was the kind of marching song that these women are, are singing. So it tells you a lot about the way they saw themselves. When these women had killed their first enemy, a man, that was when they earned their status as warriors. And some of these were ritualized initiation uh, ceremonies. So there's a Frenchman by the name of Jean Bayol, who was part of a government delegation to the kingdom and witnessed one of these events. He visited in the late 1800s and he reports watching a beautiful 16 year old girl go through an initiation rite to become a member of one of the female units. She was called out by name and required to kill a prisoner in front of a large crowd of observers. The prisoner was tied up and she was given a large blade. And she took the blade and she took three strokes and beheaded the unfortunate man, at which point the Frenchman reports with some horror that she used her fingers to clean the blood off the blade and lick them. This was the moment when she became a full member of one of these female battalions. Training for female warriors in the kingdom was intense, and a lot of the activities that they did will be very familiar to anyone who's spent time looking at what's required to develop effective fighting forces. Training for female warriors in the kingdom was intense, and a lot of the activities that they did are gonna sound very familiar to anyone who's spent any time in the military. If you look at boot camps for the army or preparation for more elite units like the SEALs or the Rangers, there's a certain pattern of things that always seem to happen in training. Number one, you have physical training. So that means intense exertion, usually while deprived of food and sleep. And the purpose of this is to develop the ability to operate under pressure and to develop mental toughness. So the ability to overcome deprivation, pain, and weakness so that you can continue to do your job in these adverse conditions. Number two, you will always find weapons training because it's necessary to practice and develop proficiency in the use of the weapons that soldiers are gonna be required to use. Three, there's always some kind of war game, right? Because you need to have your troops moving as units and cooperating with each other to effectively operate in the field against units of enemy forces. And finally, there's discipline, both personal and collective. And typically this is something that's honed through drill, deportment, and weapons handling as part of drill maneuvers. So marching drills, rifle drills, where you and your unit are all doing the same movements with the same weapons in a very prescribed way. Now, when we look at the reports we get of the training that was going on in Benin, we find all of these things. One French priest who, as a foreign visitor to Benin in the late 1800s, got a front row seat at military maneuvers, reports what he saw on that day. And he talks about a unit of these fighters storming a very high wall made of acacia branches, which by the way, happened to have really large, really sharp thorns. So these warriors who are mostly bare skinned are storming over this high wall, completely ignoring the lacerations and bleeding that are happening to everybody. The soldiers scramble over the top, they engage in mock fighting with imaginary enemies, and then they go back over the same wall, shredding themselves a second time, and at this point, they storm a village, a mock bunch of huts that are filled with prisoners. So it's an exercise in basically prisoner extraction, dragging people out of their, out of their buildings and rounding them up. They bring the prisoners in front of the king, having completed this ceremonial display of their abilities. And the king then rewards the ones who seem to be bravest and boldest. And how does he reward them? He rewards them with belts that are made of acacia branches covered in thorns. 
And the warriors who receive these belts proudly strap them around their waists into their bare skin as those thorns dig into their flesh and make them bleed all over again. Let me remind you, these warriors, every single one of them, were women. And the French priest watching this was absolutely shocked. Other training that the units in the kingdom engaged in would be regular survival expeditions, multi-day trips into the bush where they would be required to eat what they found or what they packed and to live and sleep out there in the wild. They were also involved in very regular wrestling, weapons handling, and drill exercises when they were at home, which would be living inside the palace compound itself. At the time that this French priest visited, the number of women warriors were estimated at approximately 3,000, and they were led by a general who was herself a woman. So let me point out that in the Kingdom of Dahomey, these women's units were a little bit different from some of the other Amazons that we've talked about in the series so far. The Greeks were talking about Amazons who they imagined to be all-female units or all-female tribes, but they were wrong. Because as we discovered in episode two, the female fighters they were talking about were part of these nomadic horse tribes where women and men fought and hunted alongside each other. But here in the kingdom of Dahomey in Benin, we have a slightly different variation. We have all female battalions that are part of the regular army. So when the army goes out to fight another tribe, you would have all the units there, most of them male, but some of them female units. So at that time, they would be fighting alongside their male counterparts in the military. But for the rest of the time, they were living separately in the palace compound, and they trained and ate and wrestled and did all their drills separately as all female units with their own female commanders. So they were embedded in the larger army, but they were quite distinct in the way that they operated. So this raises an interesting question. Did the existence of female soldiers in the Kingdom of Dahomey indicate a higher degree of gender equality in that area? Was this a society in which men and women had very similar roles, sort of like they did in the horse tribes of the steppe? The answer is no, actually. Because in the Kingdom of Dahomey, women became symbolically men when they joined these units. When they killed their first man, they became warriors, and that is how they were expected to live. So they had to remain celibate, which means they weren't supposed to be engaging in any kind of relationships where they were operating the way women normally do. And unlike the rest of the women in their societies, they weren't doing any of the other things either. They weren't cooking, they weren't having babies, they weren't supposed to be having lovers, they didn't have households, family and, and kin connections, none of those things. So in almost every respect, they were living exactly like the men in the army did, except they weren't allowed to get married or have lovers. They would smoke and drink and dress in ways that were expected of soldiers. So the gender rules hadn't really changed. It's just that these women were allowed to step over onto the male side of how society was arranged. And this isn't the first time that a society has allowed women to symbolically become men. At this point, I'm going to give you a little bit of a social comparison that's gonna take us away for a moment from the Kingdom of Dahomey, but it illustrates exactly what I'm talking about. Half a world away, in the mountains of Albania, Montenegro, and Kosovo, an area known as the Balkans, there are women who live as men. And this is a phenomenon that's been going on for a long time, but continues in small numbers to this day. There are still some of these women who look and live exactly like men who can be found. They are known as sworn virgins or Bernicia. Okay, so the first thing that we have to understand about these women is that this phenomenon has nothing to do with sexuality. In fact, these women aren't even allowed to have sex. So that takes relationships and attraction to the opposite sex right out of the equation. Taking the oath in the Balkans is not an opportunity to have sex with women. That's one male privilege that these women are denied. But it's really the only one. 
Because once they take the oath and become a sworn virgin, they basically step over a line and become men. They change everything, the way they dress, they change their names to masculine names, they cut their hair, they smoke, they carry weapons, and they are treated and recognized by others in their family and their society as men. Now, this is not something that anyone can do casually. Once you take that oath, everyone watches you. It's a very serious thing and there's no going back. So a woman who decides to go down this path is going to be forever cut off from the lives that are normally expected of women. And that includes any kind of sexual relationship or having children of her own. That is not a possibility. But having taken the oath unlocks a whole new world. You see, for women in the Balkans, gender roles are very strictly defined. In fact, wives are expected to be completely subordinate to their husbands. As in many other highly patriarchal societies, having a boy child is considered a great gift, and having a girl child is considered bad luck. People say things like, a girl is... Uh, you know, an ornament that goes to someone else's house. We don't care much for them. Daughters are to be given away. And when daughters are given in marriage, it had been a marriage tradition for the parents of the bride in the Balkans to present the groom with a bullet. And with that bullet was the permission to use it on their daughter if she betrayed him either sexually or by failing to perform the required hospitality that these societies require of wives. So there was a sense of complete servitude that's associated with being a woman in these societies. And there were even elaborate traditions of a new bride having to remain silent for months at a time, being on probation, having to serve not only her husband, but his entire family, and really only acquiring status if she produced a son. So in a situation like that, it's small wonder that some women would jump at the chance to live on the other side of the gender line, even if it meant a sexless existence. After taking the oath and changing their names, their voices, and their clothing, these sworn virgins or Bernicia could become the man of the family they could become the valued son. And in fact, there are examples of Balkan families where when one of the sons has, is not very responsible and doesn't look like he's going to do a good job taking over as the man in the family, that one of his older sisters might decide she'd like the part. And she takes the oath and becomes a man and becomes literally the older brother and the one who takes over when the father dies as the patriarch. So this means that the sworn virgin can acquire all the rights and privileges that are available to men. This includes inspecting marriage partners for officially female members of the family. It includes representing the family in the community, making economic decisions, and even defending the family, their honor and their security. So it's an enormous shift. Women who take the oath are expected to smoke, drink, and socialize only with men. They don't live in the women's quarters, uh, and they are treated in all respects as though they were born male, with the one exception that they can't marry or take lovers. There are examples of some of these women not only becoming the heads of families, but becoming the heads of villages. The village headman would be a senior male who was now in charge of representing not only his family, but the well-being of his entire community. And this too is possible for women who take that oath and cross over the gender line to become symbolically male. The phenomenon of sworn virgins actually reinforced the gender hierarchy in the Balkans. Because in many cases, just as we've seen with the Kingdom of Dahomey in Benin, there would be a shortage of men in the Balkans. Partly because there's a lively tradition of blood feuds. So there's murder and violence going on between families and villages that picks off a good number of men well before their expected natural death. Other men will be lost to migration for work when they leave the villages. 
And so allowing these sworn virgins or these cultural males to fill in the gaps actually reinforces the tradition that only men can do the important jobs, can represent families, and make significant decisions. What we don't see happening in the Balkans is the Rosie the Riveter phenomenon that we saw in World War II. Because across Europe, in World War II, there were large numbers of men who were obviously missing because they were fighting on the front lines. And so there was this moment of social change where women in enormous and unprecedented numbers were taking jobs on the farms and in the factories, creating munitions, weapons, and all these things, which were jobs that were previously reserved for men. And so the image of Rosie the Riveter that woman working in a factory with her muscular arm rolled up and, and bared uh, in, in, the, in that iconic image is a moment where women were doing men's work, but there was no doubt that they were still women. That is precisely what is not happening in the Balkans or in the kingdom of Dahomey. Because when you have women that are symbolically men, it ensures that only men retain the control of power and decision-making, even if not all of those men happen to have been born with penises. In the same way, the women warriors of Benin filled a gap where men were missing. By becoming symbolically male, nothing changed in the gender order of their society. The line was very rigidly defined. It's just that these particular women were given a special dispensation to step over that line and live on the other side of it. While the training to be a warrior in the Kingdom of Dahomey was difficult and painful, it did offer a route to a life that was unimaginable for most women. The majority of women would marry very young and spend their lives doing domestic chores for their husbands, children, and extended families. Cooking, cleaning, childcare. These were the things that would make up most of their time. But as a member of one of these military units, a woman would be living in the palace compound herself. She would have access to tobacco, to alcohol, and even they had their own slaves. When these women warriors would leave the compound to go out on training or to go through the streets of the city, they had their own slaves that would go ahead of them ringing a bell. When that bell told everyone else they were coming and it was time to avert your eyes because these members of this elite unit were leaving the palace and coming through the city. So a certain degree of, of reverence or respect was accorded them automatically in a way that would be impossible for women normally. From holding these positions inside the military units, some of them could even rise to positions of power and influence politically. That women shadow cabinet I told you about earlier on in the episode, where the male administrators of the kingdom all had a female overseer? Well, guess what? Those female overseers came from the king's loyal group of female warriors. And these were high-ranking, very trusted women who now had the responsibility of overseeing the male administrators in the kingdom and reporting to the king himself on the effectiveness of how these different departments were being managed. Some of them even rose to positions of prominence on the Grand Council, which was a body of members whose job it was to debate public policy and to offer suggestions to the king. So in short, by leaving the life of a woman behind and becoming a member of one of these units, it could be a gateway to a life that was otherwise entirely inaccessible to women. Now, we've so far heard reports from the British and the French about these black warriors that they observed in the Kingdom of Dahomey, but there's gonna be a lot more of these foreign reports penned very soon, particularly by the French. Because the next chapter in our story is where the French decide that they wanna have control over the coast of Benin. The French and the Kingdom of Dahomey are in a dispute over control of the lucrative ports of Cotonou and Porto Novo that lie on the coast. So the French want to be able to control these areas for themselves. And at some point, there's an agreement that's signed between the Kingdom of Dahomey and the French. The King of Dahomey understands that this agreement means he has leased the ports to the French for a certain amount of time, so permitted them to use but retains 
ownership of them himself. The French decided that after signing this paper, they basically owned those ports and they were French sovereign territory, and they were going to treat them as such. So this fundamental disagreement about the nature of the of the agreement that they had reached led to all kinds of violence that was only going to escalate. The French begin to deliberately antagonize the Dahomey people, the kingdom, and the Dahomey respond in kind. Uh, they attack some villages that have considered themselves to be under French protection, and they raid those villages and they kill people, including burning the French flag, which was flying over those areas, uh, sort of as a symbol of French sovereignty, perhaps. So there are these skirmishes and there are these episodes of violence that begin to break out as the tension between the French and the Kingdom of the Dahomey escalates. By 1890, the French were prepared to take on the Kingdom of Dahomey in all-out battle. They wanted to have complete control of the area, and the skirmishes were no longer something that they wanted to engage in. They wanted to end it once and for all. They captured four high-ranking Dahomey officials, the French did, and they held them inside a fortified French garrison, and then decided to wait for the inevitable Dahomey military attack. Inside, there were well-armed French troops. And the weaponry of the French at this point in 1890 is going to be a decisive factor in how the conflict is going to unfold. We know that the Kingdom of Dahomey have firearms, but blunderbusses are quite old-fashioned. The, the Kingdom has some rifles, but they cannot match the speed and the accuracy of the very latest and greatest rifle technology that the French have. When battle finally broke out, the French were waiting with repeating Labelle rifles and something particularly nasty called a dum-dum bullet. Now, these bullets would expand dramatically on contact. So if you were hit with one of these in an arm or a leg, at the very minimum, you would require amputation of that limb because the expansion of this bullet tearing through your muscles and shattering your bones would leave nothing much left. You'd have to cut it off. And Needless to say, if you were hit with one of these anywhere in the torso, it would almost certainly result in death. Because these bullets inflicted such ghastly and very often lethal wounds, the French didn't even have to be particularly accurate. Just hitting someone anywhere with one of these would be enough to take that soldier out of the fight. So this technology slanted the balance of power decisively toward the French. When the forces of the kingdom attack the French garrison, fighting is fierce, and there are reports of these units, including the female ones, storming towards the garrison. But because the French have this firearms technology and these horrifying bullets, they're able to eliminate many combatants long before they get close enough for the hand-to-hand -hand combat that they're so well-trained to execute. However, at close quarters, the Amazons of Benin remained absolutely horrifying. There is one Fawn tribal account of a female warrior who had been disarmed by a French soldier, then tearing out his throat with her sharpened teeth. The female fighters, in all the French accounts, were far more fearsome than their male counterparts. They would continue to storm a fortification, even in the face of overwhelming odds and absolutely horrifying injuries being inflicted on people to the right and the left of them. Many of their male counterparts would turn back and would be punished for retreating, but these women were conspicuous for not ever doing that. Now, there were several battles between the French and the Dahomey. The attack on the garrison was only the first. But the French then put together a force numbering over 2,000 soldiers. They're led by French officers, but they're a mix of French and African troops. And in some cases, the French officers themselves are mixed race. They're part Black and they're part French. So it's with this very colonial force that the French begin to march relentlessly toward the capital of the Kingdom of Dahomey itself. And along the way, of course, they are attacked many times relentlessly by the armies of the Dahomey Kingdom. In all of these exchanges, the Dahomey casualties were in the hundreds, while the French record 
record double digit losses. So for example, you might have an exchange where the French lose 32 people and the Dahomeys lose 250. These are the kinds of odds that we see again and again in every engagement that the French have with the, the defending forces. However, the French troops who were there record their admiration for the women in the kingdom armies who so relentlessly attacked them with such ferocity. In the face of nearly certain death, the French pepper their accounts with comments on the savage tenacity of these women and their prodigious bravery. Major Leonce Grandin, who later writes a voluminous account of the war with the Fawn tribe of Dahomey, said of the women warriors, quote, they bring to battle a veritable fury and a sanguinary ardor, inspiring by their courage and indomitable energy the other troops who follow them. So even though this French officer is an enemy, he's looking at these women that are attacking his men and saying, they're incredible. They are not just in the army, they're at the front of it. And their acts of courage are the things that other people follow, and they're leading the men that they serve with. The incredible amounts of courage required to repeatedly attack the French forces who were far better armed, knowing the kinds of injuries that they were capable of inflicting, requires a moment of admiration. I mean, the first battle, when the soldiers are being mowed down by French rifles and these dum dum bullets are tearing people open, right, left, and center, that would be a surprise. But these women and the other soldiers in the Dahomey army return again and again, knowing this time exactly what they're up against, knowing the the disproportionate number of casualties that they're almost certainly going to suffer. With that kind of fighting spirit, just imagine how this might have turned out if the Kingdom of Dahomey had roughly comparable military technology. If they had the same rifles and the same bullets that the French were using, this story would almost certainly have turned out very differently. But the French managed to march relentlessly onwards toward the capital of the kingdom, mowing down the opposing forces in large numbers every time they have an engagement. Yet even in defeat, even with their dwindling numbers, the women of Dahomey, the ones who've been in the army, continue to fight. There's one French report that tells that after overrunning a Dahomey settlement, uh, the women of the village, the regular civilians, had been rounded up and taken into the French compound, and they were going to be sexually abused, obviously. But some of these women who had served in the army snuck into the compound and traded places with the civilian women. So these female soldiers would allow a French soldier to take them into his tent for sex, and then as soon as he was passed out, they would kill him with his own bayonet. So this is a French report of the kind of subterfuge that was going on and the attempts to pick off Frenchmen no matter what the cost might be. Eventually though, in 1892, after a two-year campaign, the French force reaches the capital of Dahomey, having destroyed most of the military along the way through a long series of guerrilla engagements as these forces have been fighting to stop the French advance. But the French reach their objective, they reach the capital, and they find it in flames because the king decided he wasn't going to be captured and he wasn't going to leave anything for the French to possess. In 1902, the Kingdom of Dahomey was declared a French colony. In 1946, it was classified as French overseas territory. And this, this is how it remained until 1960. At that point, in 1960, it became finally, again, an independent republic. And in 1975, it was renamed Benin, in this way recapturing a name that had existed long before the Europeans arrived, and long before even the Kingdom of Dahomey itself. But what happened to the Amazons of Dahomey? What happened to the women who had served as these incredible soldiers in an unequal war? Many of them, of course, were wiped out in these battles with French firearms, but a few survived. They tried to blend back in with the conquered civilian population, 
and the few accounts that have filtered back to us about them suggest that it didn't go very well. Women who had spent their entire lives as part of an elite military unit sniffing at civilian men in their own country didn't make for great wives. There are anecdotal accounts of them threatening their husbands with violence and really having a hard time getting accustomed to the life that was expected of normal women in Benin. Large numbers of the few women who survived would doubtless have been suffering from PTSD. And there are one or two accounts of women who lived into an old age, but still wandered around imitating the maneuvers that they had performed as young women when they were soldiers. Eventually, old age took the last of them, and their story was covered over by the dust of history. But what does the story of the Amazons of Benin really teach us? First of all, we should be suspicious of stories about what comes naturally or biologically to women in terms of their behavior. I have often heard that women are just biologically more nurturing, more caring, more compassionate, and that physical exertion, pain, and especially the ability to engage in combat when horrible physical injury or death are almost certain, it's just something that women aren't very good at. This story suggests otherwise. It suggests that not just one or two freakish women, but very large numbers of women, in their thousands, under the right set of conditions, with the right training, could prove to be every bit as effective, and often more so, than their male counterparts. The female soldiers of Benin were every bit as savage and violent as the men they served alongside. Now, I'm not trying to suggest that the ability to cut off another human being's head without hesitation is necessarily an admirable or a virtuous trait. But I am pointing out that under the right set of conditions, women are every bit as capable of these sort of things as men are. The Black Amazons of Benin repeatedly demonstrated not just equal courage and combat effectiveness as their male counterparts, but frequently more. This story also suggests that if the image of women like the Black Amazons of Benin, or even the Dora Malaji in the Kingdom of Wakanda, who are fictional, these are images of women that are often looked at as exotic. Women who are physically tough, who are tenacious in the face of pain and hardship and danger. These are things that we consign to the realm of fiction or the exotic. But if that's how we look at them, then this story teaches us that that has more to do with how we raise our daughters and with the social ideas we have around women than it does with the nature of women themselves. Perhaps like Richard Burton, we're still dealing with ideas of femininity that have a lot to do with weakness and corsets than they do with effectiveness and strength. So the problem may be with how we raise our daughters rather than what we understand about human nature. I hope you enjoyed this episode and the whole four-part series on the Amazons. If you did enjoy it, please make sure to like and subscribe, and tell someone else that you think would enjoy hearing about badass women who actually lived in history. This is Villains and Virgins podcast, and you can keep up with our next episode wherever you stream podcasts. You can also find the illustrated version of the podcast on YouTube. Just search for Villains and Virgins or search under Eva Schubert. I hope I see you in the next episode.